Have you ever heard about the tragedy of Sergeant York? It's not a story the US Army would tell you. This tale has everything. Corruption, scheming, incompetence, and latrine fans. Don't believe us? Take some popcorn and let us tell you about one of the most infamous cases in the US military procurement history. It all started with the need for the close-range air defense of the US Army armored formations. Even though the usefulness of such a platform was well demonstrated during the Second World War, the subsequent development program was a string of expensive failures. The last major AA gun platform was the M42 Duster, launched shortly after the Korean War. In the early 1960s, guns were considered obsolete due to the onset of the jet age, and the general consensus was that they'd eventually make way for guided missiles. After all, when you're guiding your rockets to the moon, how hard can it be to guide them into a communist jet backside? As it turns out, very, which left the US Army in a precarious position positions in several promising gun arm projects, such as the Vigilante, were cancelled as obsolete, while their intended replacement, the Mahler missile system, failed miserably. And what was even worse, the Soviets were steadily getting ahead by not only introducing new ground attack planes, but also an AA platform of their own, the Shilka. As an intermeasure, a two-vehicle solution was proposed. It was a combination of a long-range missile system called Chaparral and the short-range Vulcan system. However, However, this combo had one major issue. In the 1970s, attack helicopters started to become a thing. After the success of the Cobra, the Soviets naturally followed suit and developed the legendary Mi-24 Hind. The Hind could fire its anti-tank guided missiles at distances where it took too long to engage it with the Chaparral and the Vulcan, which could theoretically track it had insufficient range to do so. And so, America's principal mobile air defense platform became obsolete practically overnight. To solve this problem, the US Army launched a program called Division Air Defense. The goal of the Divid program was to develop a gun-armed platform with sufficient range to defeat the Red Menace. A number of proposals were submitted by several contestants, ranging from rather conventional to utterly ridiculous, like the Avenger rotary cannon in an enclosed turret. Two of the more normal projects passed the initial round, one by General Dynamics and one by Ford. Here's where things started to get really interesting. Two prototypes of each were produced by 1980. The XM246 by General Dynamics was armed with two 35mm Orlikon cannons, while the XM247 was armed with two 40mm Beaufort guns. Yes, the very same guns that Duster had used almost three decades prior. The two designs were pitted against each in a series of tests that would later they discovered to be shamelessly rigged in favor of Ford. The 35mm gun being way more accurate? No problem. Let's treat the 40mm shell proximity fuse explosions as direct hits while disqualifying similar ammunition for the competition. Due to this and some very creative interpretations of the rules, Ford won the contest and the XM247 received a name it would never live up to, Sergeant York. Contrary to the regulations and common sense, mass production began almost immediately even though the vehicle was still basically a prototype. What could possibly go wrong? As soon as the M247 started arriving to their units, a massive wave of complaints arose from all the troops unlucky enough to be embroiled in this hot mess. The list of problems was seemingly endless. The radar was unreliable. The electronics were switching off randomly. The hydraulics were leaking or freezing over, making the whole tank unusable in winter. The press got wind of the scandal in 1982 and a thorough investigation was launched, revealing a number of cases of data tampering during the development process. All the meanwhile, the problems continued to mount. During an automated targeting system demonstration to some officers at Fort Bliss, it would immediately aim the guns at the said officers instead of the intended target. When confronted, Ford technicians claimed it was due to the fact the tank had been washed the previous day. Apparently, such rare things as rain were not considered. A few months later, upon activation, one Sergeant York immediately swung its turret around and aimed its considerable firepower at a spinning fan of local latrine it had mistaken for a helicopter rotor. For the record, the latrine wasn't the intended target. The actual helicopter remained quite safe. In another instance, the vehicle had so much trouble detecting a helicopter target that it had to install radar amplifiers on the target to make its detection easier. 
One journalist described it as testing a bloodhound's ability to track a man by covering him with beefsteaks and standing him still, alone and upright in the middle of a parking lot. The true killing blow for the program was the appearance of a new generation of Soviet anti-tank missiles that outranged the M247 considerably. The program was cancelled in 1985 and a major investigation was launched by the U.S. Department of Justice, only to be concluded a few years later with no specific outcome. The whole program was perhaps best summed up by the fact that during its course or shortly thereafter, no fewer than six high-ranking U.S. Army officers, including four generals, would retire to work for Ford as advisors. And as for the U.S. Army, well, they had to make do with jeeps and shoulder-launched missiles to this day. Of course, the U.S. Army isn't the only military with acquisition scandals in the world, but that is a story for another time.